Hi, this is Alan House. I'm a senior analyst here at Value Line. I'm joined today by two other senior analysts, Sharif Abdu and Charlie Moran. We here at Value Line hope you and your family are staying safe and dealing with this difficult time as best as possible. Today we're going to provide an update on the current state of affairs, including the economy and the stock market. We'll also discuss the actions Value Line is taking to help our subscribers navigate this difficult time. We will then recommend one stock to buy right now, and finally, answer any questions you may have. Please note that this presentation will be available on our website. That's www.valueline.com and our YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. All previous webinars are also posted. Before I jump into the heart of the presentation, for those joining us for the first time, I want to provide a brief overview of who we are here at ValueLine. We are a New York headquartered corporation that has been providing investment research for more than 85 years. Our flagship product is the ValueLine Investment Survey. The service is a unique source of financial information and is designed to help investors make informed investment decisions that fit their individual goals and levels of risk. The product includes data, information, and analysis on more than 1,700 equities that trade on the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and the Toronto Stock Exchange. It also includes economic commentary, easy to follow model portfolios, stock screens, industry-based analysis, and much more. This service, which is published weekly, is created by Value Lines Research Department which is comprised of more than 70 analysts, economists, data experts, and quantitative specialists. One thing I want to stress is that our research is completely unbiased and independent. Unlike many Wall Street brokerage firms, ValueLine has no investment banking business with any company, including the 1,700 that are included in this service. ValueLine does not execute trades for its subscribers and therefore has no vested interest in whether our subscribers buy, sell, or hold a specific equity. What's more, our staff of professional securities analysts are not permitted to own shares of any company that they cover. If you have any questions about the products or services we offer or our different tiers of subscriptions, that information can be found at valueline.com or you can call 1-800-VALUELINE. Now let's discuss the economy the stock market. This content was prepared by one of our senior analysts. The Federal Reserve will have its work cut out for it as it likely proceeds on a more restrictive monetary policy course to rein in inflation. Surging prices, the result of stimulus-driven demand and an inadequate quantity of available goods due to supply chain disruptions and labor shortages were reflected in multi-decade high 12-month advances advances in both the consumer and producer price indexes last month. Higher fixed income securities yields and uncertainty about how aggressively the central bank will raise interest rates after it ends its month, monthly bond buying program this spring are leading to increased stock market volatility with the equities of the more speculative, less capitalized companies feeling the wrath of Wall Street. Recent economic data are being closely watched by the Federal Reserve. The U.S. consumer sector, which was the main driver of the economic recovery for the pandemic-driven pullback, is showing some signs of fatigue, with inflation likely hurting recent purchasing power. On point, December retail sales decreased 1.9%, far more than expected, and consumer sentiment in early January fell to a second lowest level in the decade. This may prove to be the temporary impact of the Omicron variant on the U.S. economy, but the Federal Reserve will have to tread carefully with its monetary actions to avoid applying the brakes too hard, leading to a slowdown in economic growth. Meanwhile, fourth quarter earnings season did not get off to a great start, with disappointing reports from banking giants J.P. Morgan, Chase, and Goldman Sachs unnerving investors. As we thought might be the case heading into the reporting period, Investors are focusing on the inflation-impacted forecast companies are providing, and J.P. Morgan's tepid guidance was not well-received. 
The results from the big banks, which come in the early part of the earnings season, are often seen as a barometer of the health of the broader economy. In conclusion, an increase in uncertainty among investors has historically produced an uneven performance in the U.S. stock market. Thus, we believe a well-diversified portfolio of quality equities is the best near-term investment strategy ahead of what is likely to be a period of less supportive monetary policies by the central bank. In a rising interest rate environment, we think bonds should be given smaller weightings in one's portfolio. To paraphrase our senior analyst, it has been long, excuse me, it has long been value line's perspective that equity should be a core component of a well-rounded, well-diversified portfolio in good economic times or less favorable times, in bull markets or bear markets. And with monetary stances changing in the not too distant future, we believe it is imperative to focus on higher quality equities. On that note, Value Line is providing a great deal of information and analysis to help our subscribers. We, now, we know that most of our users depend on our weekly stock reports, time-tested ranking systems, and other valuable services. In addition, Value Line provides a great deal of daily content that can help you avoid the pitfalls and profit during this volatile time in the stock market. Every business day, senior members of Value Line's research department review the most actively traded stocks, company press releases, news stories, trade periodicals, and other sources for data and information that may change our view and investment recommendations for specific stocks. When something noteworthy comes across as our desk, we immediately publish a supplementary report that outlines the new information and, importantly, what it means for the stock and shareholders. This content is posted throughout the day on our website. Again, that's www.valueline.com. We, we will now show you how to access it. Once signed in, head to the dashboard where Sharif is already located. This is the main landing page for subscribers. Under the quick links, click on supplementary reports. As you can see, the research department has been busy publishing our updated thoughts on the stocks that we track. We strongly suggest that subscribers visit this page often. We are also monitoring our financial strength grades. Some individual companies incurred a lot of debt or sold stock to improve liquidity this past year, especially those dealing with sharply reduced demand for their offerings and supply chain problems, among, among many other issues. Due to the changing structure of company balance sheets, Valueline has been reviewing and altering our proprietary financial strength grades for the stocks in our coverage universe. These changes are posted each week in our selection and opinion newsletter. For those, of you, for those of you that don't know, financial strength, along with price stability, another proprietary value line measure, are the two metrics that are used to calculate a stock's safety rank, a key measure of risk. When considering new stocks to invest in, we strongly suggest that you utilize financial strength and safety in your decision-making process. For more information in regard to our proprietary ranks and ratings, value line provides a user guide that can be assessed, accessed via the investment education section of our website. Lastly, this is a good time to mention the case for individual stocks is quite strong over broad index funds. Certainly particular industries and sectors will recover more quickly than others during and after this pandemic runs its course. Now let's move on onto the one stock to buy right now. For this, let's go to the screener. Value line subscribers have access to 15 preset screens and 50 fields. I should also mention that another 100 or so fields are available, but it requires a higher level of subscription. If this interests you, please call 1-800-VALUE-LINE. Now we're going to go through the screening process. Today we'll start the screening process by looking at growth rates, particularly over the long term. Then we'll add some shorter term metrics. The first screen we want to look at is 
future earnings growth per share for five years. For those of, excuse me, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Value Line provides estimates for both the short term, as in this year and next, as well as the three to five year investment horizon. For this screen, we are focusing on companies that are estimated to achieve five year earnings per share growth in excess of 25%. Now Sharif is gonna run this screen. There are roughly 5,700 stocks in our database. And as you can see, we're already down to 237 stocks. So we've substantially narrowed down the list of candidates just by running the one screen. So we want to stay on the theme of longer term performance. We're going to apply another filter, this time looking at sales. We also want to look at companies that are growing their top lines at a robust clip. Indeed, while earnings growth is important, if a company is growing earnings by repeatedly cutting costs, this might create a problem down the road. Hence, we want to look at companies with sales growth of at least 25% over the, over the next five years. So Sharif's going to run that screen. And after, down, after running that screen, as you can see, we're down to 22 stocks. So we went uh, from over 5,700 to 237. Now we're down to 22. Our next screen, we're going to look at a little shorter term. We're going to focus on stocks that are likely to outperform the broader market averages in the year ahead. So we're looking at stocks that are ranked one and two for timeliness. As you can see, after running this screen, we're down to eight stocks. And they're all uh, pretty well-known names, um, as you can see by the list. So you can certainly make an argument for any of the remaining stocks. And investors interested in adding new positions should consider them. However, only one stock can be today's one stock to buy right now. And after consulting with a number of my senior analysts, we prefer and recommend Nexstar Media Group, ticker NXST. Before we click on Nexstar, please note that the screens can be saved and revisited by utilizing the created save screen button at the top, which Sharif is showing you now. Now let's click on next and get some additional information from Value Lines Digital Report, which Sharif is going to do. Thank you, Sharif. Nextar Media Group is a television broadcasting and digital media company focused on the acquisition, development, and operation of TV stations and interactive community websites. It owns, operates, sells, and services 198 TV stations in 116 markets, reaching 39% of U.S. households. It provides digital publishing, content management, and digital video ad platforms to media publishers and advertisers. Nexstar is very inexpensive on a PE basis. The company has enjoyed strong earnings momentum of late, which is poised to continue with the help of recent acquisitions in the digital media field. The company's healthy balance sheet will actually make further acquisitions a distinct possibility down the road. The company's margins are also likely to receive a boost from recent restructuring measures. The stock is a solid choice for the year ahead and for the three to five year poll, given its substantial appreciation potential. We believe a focus on content first growth strategy is a reason for optimism moving forward. Okay, as you can see, the stock now trades at roughly uh, just under $155 a share. As you can see in the banner section, I think it's $154.75. Um, with that, Sharif's now gonna click on the last full page report, which um, was very recently published. As you can see in the statistical array, or the center of the report that includes the financial data, we look for the company's strong earnings advances to continue going forward. We also look for sales to climb at a solid annual clip over the year ahead and the three to five year poll. It should be noted that the company's results were boosted by the media general acquisition in January of 2017 and the Tribune median purchase in September of 2019. In summary, the company, the company not only has strong top and bottom line prospects, but its balance sheet is in solid shape as well. 
the stock sports a favorable time to shrink, while 18 months and three to five year price appreciation potential stand out from the pack at recent valuations. The stock's price growth persistence is also very favorable at 100 out of 100. While the beta coefficient is moderately above the overall markets at 1.5, the stock does have an average safety score of three. All told, we think that Nexar's position is quite strong and the stock can form one of the building blocks of a successful portfolio. It is today's one stock to buy right now. We will now tackle your questions. Please note that we typically can't answer complex questions about specific stocks on the spot. For this, I recommend a review of our latest reports. The first few questions were submitted prior to this presentation. Now I'll hand it off to Charlie and Sharif. Thank you. Hello, my name is Charlie Moran. I'm a senior analyst here at Value Line, and uh, we have a few questions to answer. Uh, the first one I had was regarding uh, the, the uh, I guess it was from Bill, uh, mentioning the term high quality and how that's derived. That is uh, something that is in specific to Value Line that is in reference to uh, stocks that have solid fundamentals and strong balance sheets and are perceived to be safety, but that is a subjective term. Uh, the second question I have is from uh, Nathaniel asking about uh, the P ratio and the reason for it being different from other sources that he's seen in the past. And I guess I could answer that by saying that the P ratio in this case uh, with Nexstar that you see in the top band there, the P ratio of 8.7, that is something that is uh, calculated by uh, using the six-month forward and the six-month past earnings uh, for a 12-month uh, earnings calculation, and that is divided into the price. I think that it's often common for other sources to use either a trailing uh, estimate or a, uh, a forward 12-month estimate. Uh, so that might account for the discrepancies uh, that you see. Uh, Sharif, do you have any other questions you see to be answered? Sure. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Uh, Joseph Foster sent in a question. Uh, he's asking on a value line report that shows 19% capitalization, for example. Does that mean that the company has debt of 19%? So let's use Nexstar uh, and their balance sheet as an example. Right here we see that it has a 74% debt to total capital ratio. That's what that 74% indicates. So the way we calculate that is we look at the long-term debt. That is what we're focused on is long-term debt, not short-term debt, but long-term. And we add that to the shareholder's equity. So let's say, for example, here we have... In 2020, their long-term debt, they finished a year with about $7.6 billion in long-term debt. Shareholders' equity was $2.5 billion, so we would add those two numbers together, and then we would divide long-term debt by the combination of long-term debt and shareholders' equity. Okay, so long-term debt and shareholders' equity, that represents total capital. Then we're going to divide long-term debt alone by total capital, so 7.6 divided by 7.6 plus 2.5, that gives you your, your debt ratio, basically, your, your, your percentage of debt to total capital. Uh, and that number is important for a number of, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, if you take at it, uh, look at it for, from uh, um, uh, the perspective of you as an individual, you basically want to look at how much debt do I have relative to my total net worth? And that's what that number is meant to indicate. So for a company, they want to see what excuse me, what their total debt is relative to the size of the entire enterprise, the total capitalization of the entire enterprise. That's why that number is important. Uh, Charlie, anything else jumping out at you? You see a couple of good questions here. Yeah, we've had, a, we've had a, a number of questions regarding the debt levels, and I guess I just want to uh, add further to your comments on the capitalization uh, in, in terms of evaluating whether the debt level might be worrisome. Uh, beneath the long-term debt level in the, in the capital structure box is the total interest coverage that you can see there at, at 4.3, and that is the uh, the, the 
<coughs> excuse me, the cash flow uh, coverage of the of the interest expense associated with that debt. And while there's no set bar or level uh, of in terms of a number for coverage, uh, that is also a metric that you can use to see how that is trending, to see how, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to meet obligations and covenants, if there are any. But also, uh, I saw the, the 2019, you can see the uptick in the level of long-term debt, and it's important to know the origin of, of what happened there. I believe that they uh, acquired Media General and possibly Tribune, and so, uh, in doing so, that is a, a, a big reason for the, the, the debt picking up as opposed to prior years. And you can see that it's trending in the right direction, trending downward. Uh, so um, it looks as though they are doing a, a decent job of delevering. Uh, so I just wanted to put that into, into context. Uh, there are many ways to evaluate the health in terms of the financials of the, of the balance sheet. Sharif? Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to add to what Charlie said. He made an excellent point there, which is we have to put everything into context. So if we look at Nexstar and we see that it has a 74% debt to total capital, and then you compare it to a company uh, like, let's say, um, I'm going to pull a number out of my head, um, uh, a company that manufactures, you know, mouse traps. For Nexstar, that 74% debt to total capital, you have to look at its peer group uh, to, to, to assess whether that level of debt is excessive or appropriate. So Nexstar, they're a television broadcasting company and digital media. That's a very capital intensive industry to be in because of all the infrastructure that they have to uh, put in place. Uh, so there's a lot of investment that that, that 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 industry requires a lot of investment. Uh, for example, let's look at something like uh, the real estate industry. Uh, I personally cover a number of REITs, uh, real estate investment trusts, um, and the debt to total capital will vary greatly even within that one industry. So a REIT uh, like a company like Public Storage uh, which builds basically warehouses that are unfinished. There's not much investment, uh, relatively speaking, that is required there. Their debt to total capital is very reasonable. It looks like it's about 35% for, if, if memory serves me right. Uh, and then you look at a different company that's also a REIT, like let's say a Boston property. They own, uh, they're one of the largest office landlords in the country. Office buildings in New York City, San Francisco, Boston, Washington, D.C., these are very expensive capital uh, intensive markets. So a company like Boston Properties, which owns office uh, properties, which are very expensive to both buy, to finish, to maintain, their debt to total capital is gonna be much higher than a company like let's say public storage. And that's just within one industry. So you really have to look at an individual company relative to its peer group uh, in order to assess, you know, should I be concerned about this number? Should Is this number telling me something? Um, uh, so that's it for that number. Uh, Charlie, uh, do you want to take another question? Well, I, I see a question here. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump in. Gary Omel sent in a question. He's saying, uh, how long will the chip shortage last uh, and will it get worse? So that's the million dollar question right now, right? Everybody wants to know we have this uh, shortage of uh, semiconductors, of other chips. These are the components that go into other products, whether it's smartphones, TVs, your car, <laughs> everything now uses chips of some type. So uh, it, it, the projections and the estimates right now vary greatly. Some companies or some uh, analysts are projecting that the chip shortage will be some of the pressures will start to ease by the end of this year, by the end of 2022. Other analysts are saying it may drag on into the middle of 2023. Uh, so there's, there's so many factors that go into that, that that's something that's very difficult right now to, to kind of put our finger on exactly how long the chip shortage will last. It, it, at the very least, it's going to last for the rest of this year, uh, unfortunately, and possibly maybe linger a little bit longer, uh, although possibly some of the pressures will start to ease by the end of this year. Uh, Gary Olmel uh, had a follow-up question, which was, uh, will any EV company 
and I, I'm assuming he means uh, electric vehicle company, overtake Tesla in the U.S. Uh, me personally, I don't think so, not in the short term. I think they have such a lead uh, in that uh, specific market. Uh, and specifically, it's not just how many vehicles they're selling, it's the infrastructure. Uh, it's the uh, charging stations that are proprietary to Tesla vehicles. Tesla has thousands of charging stations around the country. There's been such a lead time for Tesla to get to that point that for a company starting now or starting maybe last year, a company that's gotten, uh, Tesla has such a head start already that I don't foresee somebody overtaking them, at least in the short term. It may be, uh, might take a couple more years before somebody kind of gets up to the same level uh, of infrastructure that uh, Tesla has already established. Uh, Charlie, anything jumping out at you? Yeah, the last one was uh, Thomas Kenny had asked about a uh, the reason for the decline in the, in the common shares outstanding out to 2024-26. If you can see on the page uh, that that uh, I don't know if you still have the cursor there, but the common shares outstanding on the page is forecast to go from about 40 million to 35 million over the next three to five years. Uh, and that is just, you know, a function of, of the analyst making that projection. I'm not familiar with, you know, management at Nexstar, but I assume that they have uh, mentioned that that is part of a capital allocation program, and that is at the discretion of, of the analyst and is always the case uh, with regard to uh, each individual stock that they cover. Sharif? Uh, okay, we have Alfred Andrup. Uh, Alfred had a simple but I think an important question. Uh, he's asking, uh, can a sector or industry be used as a filter for a stock screen? And the answer is absolutely it can. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me get you there. So we go to the dashboard. Now we go to the screener. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you see here, uh, it's actually one of the very first screens that you can apply under company data. So you can choose an individual industry. Let's say you... You think that the uh, cement industry, <laughs> they're, they're going to do gangbusters business in the next 12 months. You want to look just at cement makers, okay? Um, so you would go under company data and you would click on the industry. Uh, and you can choose that individual industry here, whether that's aerospace, apparel, automotive, bank, yada, yada, yada. All of our individual industries are listed here. So let's say you're not looking at just one industry. Let's say you think two or three related industries are going to do very well in the next 12 months, and you just want to focus your screen on those two or three industries. So let's say, for example, you think that auto parts and automotive are going to do well in the next year. So you would want to use this dropdown, and you would say, is one of. Instead of is, you would want to go to is one of. And that would allow you to add multiple industries all together. So let's say auto parts. And we can see now that we've gotten our list down to 5,700 auto parts makers. And now you want to include automotive in general. So that would include all of the automakers like Toyota, Ford, et cetera. Um, so you can see that now we have added both here. We have 90. We have the 57 auto parts makers plus all the automotive in you know all the companies that are included in the automotive industry as well um, so you absolutely can use industry as a stock screen and uh, you know it's something it's 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 often one of the starting points that I personally use if I think that an industry is gonna has very good prospects uh, you know whether that's in the the next year the next 18 months the next three to five years I often use industry as a starting point when I am applying a stock screen personally uh, Charlie Anything else dropping out at you? No, that's it. That's all uh, I saw. Uh, I thank you for the questions. Uh, if we could get back to the moderator. That concludes today's uh, event. You may now disconnect your lines and have a great day.